Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here today with my co-host, Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with Charles Dosse. He's the CEO of the DYDX Foundation. They just launched the V4 app chain, and we'll be speaking with Charles about DYDX, the decision uh, process that went into evolving DYDX into its own app chain. We'll talk about the launch, how things are going. Uh, we'll also talk about the perpetual markets, space, MEV, and so much more. Before we get started, quick disclaimer, this is a sponsored episode and some of us at Epicenter hold DYDX tokens. So Charles, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks for having us. Seb, man, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. I'm a very early uh, fan of the show for many, many years. So I want to start with uh, a big thank you for your hard work for, for the community years after years bear market, bull market, you've been uh, educating the community, giving the stage to, to many. So I'm very grateful. I've learned a lot uh, along the years and I'm sure uh, most of the audience has as well. So congratulations for the hard work and, and thanks again. So Charles, you're one of these guys who left France uh, early in your career to move to, to Asia. Uh, what have you been doing uh, for the last 20 years? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been uh, studying in France and Canada and uh, eventually did an internship in India. Uh, and I felt the energy in Asia was just really uh, uh, addictive. So I wanted to get my first job in, uh, in Asia. And uh, long story short, I ended up in China, then in Hong Kong. I started a business in Hong Kong, I sold this business a few years later to one of my customers, I decided to kind of pivot and uh, make time to um, upskill myself in finance, which was a topic uh, I, I really liked uh, beside my, my everyday work. Um, I was invited later on by the Hong Kong government uh, to join them as the head of fintech, working on growing the ecosystem of, of fintech in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the leading financial center and it has went through its um, kind of uh, reinvent itself into a fintech hub. And, and I was uh, leading this together with central banks and regulators over there. So great, uh, great experience at building and shaping ecosystem. And one of the vertical I was focusing on was, uh, was blockchain. So uh, one of my, uh, my early love. So I've been helping a lot of uh, leading companies at the time to set a foot in, uh, in Asia and start their expansion in Asia from, from Hong Kong. Among them was Consensus, uh, which eventually I joined. Um, I was head of Asia uh, for Consensus for, for a few years helping Metamask, helping uh, central banks to build uh, uh, early CBDCs, DeFi projects, NFT projects uh, all over Asia, from Japan to uh, to Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. And fast forward, I joined the DYDX Foundation now, where I am the CEO, and where I work with uh, a team of 20 plus people, which are spread uh, all over the world, very close to where uh, most of the users and builders around DYDX are. How did you come into this role as CEO of the DYDX Foundation and what was that transition like? I wanted, I spent a lot of time at Consensus, right? So Consensus is a great company where there is uh, essentially uh, supplying and providing infrastructure for the space. Should it be Inferon, the RPC nodes or Metamask for, for wallets and many other services. So I spent a lot of time on Ethereum. I spent a lot of time building infrastructure. Uh, for various uh, various projects and uh, and uh, and institutions, and I wanted to kind of go up and spend more time at the application level. And DYDX was a very interesting project. Uh, DeFi is a very confirmed use case uh, within DeFi. Perpetuals uh, are also uh, having a tremendous traction and essentially exist in the uh, in in DeFi and because of crypto. Um, exploring the Cosmos stack was also interesting. I, I started my journey on, on, on in crypto in uh, with Bitcoin, obviously, like many in uh, in 2011. Spent a lot of time in uh, on Ethereum, uh, but the Cosmos stack is definitely a super strong candidate for our global infrastructure in uh, in the coming de decades. So spending time on on DeFi on Cosmos, uh, spe uh, also getting more interactions with DAOs. There was um, a lot of uh, kind of new topics I wanted to to go deep diving in. And um, and kind of uh, leading the DYDX Foundation team is uh, is there, there is never a dull day. A lot of uh, a lot of activities. Obviously, the migration from version three of DYDX to now the DYDX chain and version four 
is extremely uh, extremely intense but uh, highly rewarding so we're having all uh, a lot of fun so so uh dydx announced uh last year that it would essentially move to its own app chain and this really sent waves through the cosmos industry i think it was some of the biggest news and, and it's certainly very positive news uh in the you know, market conditions that we've been in for the last year or so and uh, it's something I've thought about a lot in terms of, you know, how chains evolve from smart contracts to moving to L2s to to, to graduating essentially uh, to becoming fully sovereign uh, from the uh, consensus layer all the way to the application level. And so I'm curious, what was that graduation path like? And, you know, before we actually before that, maybe... You know, what was the decision making process of moving to a Cosmos chain? Uh, what were their criteria that we were you looking for? Were there other platforms or protocols um, that uh, were, were contenders here? And and then yeah, what was that that graduation path or that that upgrade path um, look like? Absolutely. Maybe to cover these questions, the best is to start with the history of the YDX. The YDX was founded by Antonio Giuliano. Uh, back in 2018, Antonio is a is a former uh, Coinbase engineer, so he got very early uh, exposure to the space in general, to the technology, and decided to uh, found uh, DYDX. So he's the original founder behind the technology of uh, of DYDX. Um, DYDX started on Ethereum mainnet, um, and later was one of the very early movers to uh, layer twos with uh, StarkX. Uh, and is up to up to today one of the largest contributors to the number of transactions and like, level of activity on, on layer twos in general. Um, but I guess the product team over there at DYDX Trading has been always very independent and focused on product and user experience rather than trying to accommodate uh, some technology which was evolving. So when you when you get your application to sit on someone else's blockchain. Uh, you can get essentially you can move faster uh, and you can benefit from uh, innovation from others and, and services from others. But you, it also brings you some kind of uh, challenges and trade off. Uh, sitting on general purpose blockchain means that uh, you will be sitting on um, one infrastructure, which is number one, not yours, and also designed to accommodate many different types of use cases. And DYDX has always been laser focused on one use case, which is essentially. DeFi for perpetuals, being a, a leading decentralized exchange for perpetuals contracts. So, progressing with a uh, uh, progressing with the product and getting more and more traction, as uh, the team at, at DYDX started to to look at how they could essentially keep evolving and and deploying more innovations and more features for for, for the product in general, and also kind of uh, mitigating the as uh, the dependencies they, they had from from other teams building these layer tools and we all know it's very hard work and and everyone has been doing a fantastic work but when your application is going at very fast pace sometimes you just you just need to find whatever will uh, will be required to to feed your uh, to feed your work uh, so um there was a few trade-offs as a number of as a number of transactions some layer two were still still not there compared to the to the the growth of dydx uh, a few components were not able to be decentralized. So on version three of the YDX, this is public information. The order book, which is um, one of the, the core, the core, the core modules of uh, of uh, a decentralized exchange, is actually off chain. It's running on AWS servers. There is not enough uh, capacity and throughput within any layer two today to host um, to host um, uh, an order book. So having this product evolving, but still having some kind of uh, uh, avenues for progress. Uh, the team at DYDX has been um, essentially uh, exploring the different technologies available at the time. I think the process started 18 months ago or so. And they looked at uh, many different uh, stacks, at the different layer two technologies, ZK, Solana, probably Polkadot. I guess the team has been really looking uh, looking all around. And where, where it was all starting, it was kind of a reverse engineering uh, uh, exercise thinking what do you need for uh, an order book type of exchange? And uh, something people not, don't necessarily know is that within an order book type of exchange, uh, there is uh, a lot of market makers and, and users which are essentially uh, uh, placing orders, canceling orders. Sometimes this order match and they will get settled. So there is a very high velocity uh, on, the, uh, on the order book overall. 
So how can you get uh, the experience uh, all these uh, systematic traders need uh, on technology and what kind of technology can uh, essentially uh, adapt and, uh, and provide, provide this? And the choice of uh, architecture for this new DYDX chain, which was launched a few weeks ago now, was to essentially host the order book not on chain because you will get the constant latency of the block time, which is not providing a good enough experience for traders. So the order book is not on chain, but technically the order book is, the order book is still decentralized. And the way the decentralization is happening is actually by hosting the order book in the memory of the validators. So the, the DYDX chain has been launched. Uh, the DYDX chain is used for settlement of orders, but on, uh, at the order book layer, the order book is uh, technically not on chain, but within the memory of the validators. So this can really provide a very high frequency and high velocity order book, similar to what uh, what traders experience in uh, in centralized type of crypto exchanges, and uh, and 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 also providing a full control of the stack for the, the engineers involved in DYDX not having to depend on the progress of a roadmap for a layer two or, or a ZK, being able to really integrate the full technology and keeping the pace of, of innovation, the product deserve and, and the market pools. Yeah, this is really interesting that DYDX is a project that is starting with the product experience first and then the blockchain follows from the product experience. Rather than the other way around, where where it's like you're part of some blockchain community and you build build your product experience there, it's the opposite way around. And and the the power of a a cosmos chain is exactly that, right? Like you, you can basically tell the validators to do whatever is needed for the optimal product experience. So uh, that's actually really interesting. So this cosmos chain, it is not going to be EVM compatible or what are its EVM compatibility properties like and is it an issue that it is not not com it, it lacks some forms of compatibility that's a great question for for the DYDX use case which is trading perpetuals uh, perpetuals contracts uh, essentially we don't have the same requirements uh, uh, of composability as some other type of uh, use cases in uh, in DeFi so if you are a lending protocol or if you are, for example, an AMM, you will need to have all kinds of assets around you and a, a very large ecosystem. When you focus on, on derivative like uh, the DYDX, is you, essentially every trade at DYDX starts with USDC. And from this USDC collateral, you will be able to express your opinion in a, on a synthetic product, which will represent uh, a, a bullish view or a bearish view on any kind of crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. So we don't have the same requirements of uh, of composability as uh, as some others. To come back to the uh, EVM compatibility question, uh, in these early days of the DYD chain, uh, all the business logic is actually on the on the chain itself. As uh, the goal is uh, was really to design a Formula One of uh, of of trading for perpetuals, and all the layers we could essentially simplify or abstract and get the business logics uh, integrated into. The chain itself was essentially helping to get the performance closer to uh, to be optimal for for the users. There might be a time where uh, EVM compatibility will come, but at the moment the, the chain is starting with really this um, this focus on performance and this uh, focus on the sole use case, uh, which is the use case of uh, of, of DYDX. Essentially, the DYDX chain is not uh, like many other layer ones, which will invite a lot of builders building on the chain. Many people will be building around the chain and the core application, but the goal is really to keep uh, the, I will say the, the leadership we have on the market uh, as a protocol in a, in derivative market. For for people who don't know, derivative uh, crypto derivative market is uh, 10x uh, larger than spot uh, crypto trading. So every time there is one Bitcoin or one ETH being traded in the spot market, about 10 times larger amounts is being traded on, on derivatives. So that's a very, very large use case, uh, mostly uh, used by market makers, institutions, or prosumers. Um, and being focused on this since uh, 2018 has essentially helped DYDX to grow as uh, today the, the world's largest decentralized exchange for crypto derivatives, uh, which represents about a billion dollars of trading every day. 
um, about 80 million dollars of fees collected uh, on the version three of uh, of DYDX and uh, market shares which are going uh, every month versus the centralized crypto crypto exchanges. And if we want to project ourselves a little bit in the future, if you think of the the journey of Uniswap, which started two or three years ago. Uh, obviously, Uniswap started from zero and today represent between 5 to 7% of the spot trading market. Uh, there, is a, there is a potential for DYDX to really expand from this 1.5% uh, market shares today in, uh, in crypto derivative and growing, knowing that I think um, um, the market in general start to realize the limitations of, of centralized exchanges and, and start to look at uh, expanded the different uh, venues for expressing their opinion on the market. So when I was looking at DYDX a um, couple of years ago, one of the big revelations I realized was when you think of a Uniswap, for, for the Uniswap to successfully do an exchange or an exchange like experience for a user, the it needs to have control over the asset that the user is interested in. So if it's just like MKR and ETH, Somebody has to provide an MKR, somebody has to provide it and eat. So those things have to be there. But with DYDX and actually the entire perpetuals market, what seems like a crazy property is that you can have the entire market exist with only USDC or a stable coin as a base. You don't actually need the assets themselves uh, in the exchange. And so... And so basically like the market can like stand on its own without even a lot of bridges to uh, any places. As long as there's a stable coin, the market can exist, even if the br even if the bridges to other ecosystems may, may be weak. That, that, that seems like really interesting. And so how does that work? Like how, how is that possible? And how does a perpetual work underneath that makes it possible? So a perpetual is a, a certain type of futures contract. Uh, so the futures contract is essentially a, a, a kind of an adjacent market to the spot market where people will be able to uh, express their opinion should they be bull or, or bears on one type of asset. Uh, historically, the, the futures market exists in the equity world for quite some, some time now. And they usually kind of expire. Uh, within the end of the month or within three months, you can buy futures sometimes up to six months or more. And then the market will be able to take a bet on uh, and defining a price of, uh, of an asset uh, in the future. So the future contract. Um, the innovation which came in 2018 uh, via BitMEX, uh, the centralized crypto exchange out of Hong Kong, uh, was essentially to create a new type of futures contract which were not expiring at the end of the month anymore but uh, kind of uh, updating uh, themselves on the price uh, on, on the underlying assets you know, on an hourly basis. So this type of, uh, of contracts are called perpetual contracts uh, because they, they kind of bring the perpetuity and the, the kind of uh, constant liveliness of these futures contracts. So it's, it gives to traders an opportunity to quickly enter into one market without having to move the underlying asset. So you can start with USDC and starting to say, from my USDC, I want to express my opinion on the market on, on Bitcoin, on ETH. There is hundreds of different perpetual markets available. And uh, being able to enter this market and uh, exit them very quickly without, I would say, the underlying logistics. Uh, the world of, of futures and, and derivatives is, as I was mentioning earlier, a very large market, uh, way larger than uh, the underlying asset. Uh, should you think of equity derivative or commodities derivative and crypto derivative as well. So it's a very um, elegant and efficient way for essentially traders and the market to define a price and, and accelerate and, uh, and, and, and make more optimal the price discovery of any assets. So in, in my mental model, so if I go to DYDX and I go long ETH, when I make the trade happen, let's assume actually you are the counterparty on the other side with whom it's passed. So you have gone short ETH, I've gone long ETH. Now, mine is a perpetual position and yours too. So I should be able to hold it for years if needed. Whereas 
our durations may not match. So you on the other side might want to get out of position of, of the position, you know, maybe 30 seconds later or 30 minutes later. So how how is that uh, gap covered? How can I have something permanent while you being my counterparty and you are not actually permanently there? Yeah, what is it that the exchange is doing? So there is there is a complex mechanism uh, which uh, people can document themselves about at the YDX Academy, for example. Uh, essentially, working around the funding rate and the open interest overall, or where actually traders will be compensating or being compensated for uh, variations between uh, their contract as it is today and the underlying demands for for these contracts. So all of this works with the funding rate around the derivative contracts, which essentially every hour will kind of check as uh, the level of buyers and sellers. And if you've been too optimistic or not enough, there will be a, a rebalancing made every hour. So uh, what kinds of assets uh, can, can people trade on DYDX today? And um, and what, what is the roadmap for, for you know, supporting more assets? Absolutely. So DYDX offers perpetual market. Uh, today, there is about uh, in the version 3 of DYDX sitting on the top of, uh, of Ethereum la uh, layer 2 from StarkX, about 30 uh, different trading pairs. Uh, so people can trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, kind of uh, a long tail of, of, of assets. As every market, uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin represents roughly speaking 80% of the volume. Um, and uh, what is very interesting with the, uh, with the now born DYDX chain is uh, the upcoming upgrade of the DYDX protocol itself, where um, the number of trading pairs will expand uh, to up to 100, and people will be in the near future being able to launch permissionless market. So the type of innovation we've seen uh, on the crypto market with Uniswap, where people were able to start uh, some trading pairs and essentially starting a market in a, in a permissionless way, uh, the same is, uh, is happening uh, in the near future at DYDX, where people will be able, will be able to launch uh, perpetual uh, markets uh, on their own, uh, this following um, uh, a, risk, a risk framework as well as a liquidity framework, which is being designed and voted by the DYDX DAOs. But that's a great innovation, which I think the market has been expecting for a long time, making sure that uh, you can get uh, essentially market launch at high velocity, but also in a safe and, and, uh, and, uh, and highly liquid way for, for new perpetuous contracts. So let's, uh, this idea of permissionless markets is, is pretty interesting. Um, let's dive into that a little bit. Like, what does it mean to be able to create a permissionless market? So what it means is first uh, and foremost, uh, probably more trading pairs. So the users will define that. It's a little bit some of the magic of crypto when uh, you define software, you define a recipe, and then you let it, uh, you let the market express themselves with, with this kind of new innovation. So what, where I'm excited about is uh, about the unknown about this kind of innovation. So many people are thinking, okay, there will be no more mean coins, there will be more shit coins uh, market. So that's one thing. And, and if people want of the, some more, more of this, they will be able to launch those markets. Where it's more interesting, in my opinion, is permissionless markets really open uh, a new avenue for uh, truly new markets and DeFi only market to exist. I think if we really want to see the DeFi market to expand and to keep, uh, I would say, um, uh, getting mind shares and and uh, and kind of uh, overtaking as uh, the legacy systems which have uh, limitations, we need to make sure that we essentially set the, the DeFi market for permissionless innovation as well. And um, where, where we've seen some kind of peaks of growth uh, in, uh, in the crypto market in general is when this kind of innovation and this kind of new market came, uh, came about without being able to be replicated by centralized type of infrastructure. So think of Uniswap in the, for the DeFi summer, uh, think of NFTs, think of different type of innovations which, have been, uh, which came to life and gave this kind of bump of growth and herbs of new users coming into our space. And with a permissionless market at, uh, at DYDX, I think we have potentially uh, a very strong uh, set of, uh, uh, of, uh, of components to really call for this new innovation. DeFi will keep expanding if we keep inventing new products which can only exist in DeFi. If we only replicate or opti optimize whatever exists uh, in the traditional systems, 
we kind of define uh, the growth uh, and cap the growth we can uh, we can get access to. So permissionless market means that users will be able to define a risk um, a risk framework around this asset. The risk framework will be considering, for example, the liquidity, the age of the asset, the type of the asset, uh, as well as a, a market uh, a market making kind of uh, framework as well, making sure that when a market is launched. Uh, in a permissionless way, it does not become toxic. That's also very important. Being remaining open to innovation, but making sure innovation is not burning fingers of users too much. So as I said, we probably can, we, we, we probably see a, a long tail of new crypto assets coming up, but also we can think of uh, new indexes as starting to be uh, to be traded in derivative market as much as they are in the traditional market as well. Thinking of new type of asset, if you want to express, for example, your opinion, on uh, on uh, on the price of rice, corn, cocoa, or some other commodities. Today, some of these markets are very much, uh, I would say, close to a, a little fuse. For example, in uh, in the Chicago Chicago exchange, where you can trade commodities. And if you want to express your opinion on these markets, uh, you can't today. And I think that's the power of DeFi is giving uh, really the kind of internet distribution to markets which used to be very very kind of uh, uh, constrained in terms of geographies and where permissionless market can possibly uh, impress us and, and surprise us is by defining this kind of new product which will be exclusively available in defined in defined markets and, and and kind of creating this new demand and and bringing additional value additional volumes additional users new type of users as well on the market so, as I mentioned earlier, commodities is probably something which which uh, which is interesting to explore. Some people mentioned the insurance market, which we're also expecting to kind of build some edge uh, with permissionless uh, permissionless derivative market and 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 the permissionless uh, setup at DYDX might be something they will they will be exploring. Um, if you want to look at uh, building some new type of um, indexes for all type of real world assets or crypto assets. And, and defining them in in a in a derivative way, this will be also a very fertile soil for every financial engineers to express themselves and leverage the, the capabilities of DeFi. So, I mean, the the one product I'm really looking forward for is we have the you know, the Indian stock exchange is called uh, you know, like uh, Bombay Stock Exchange, and there's a index of of that stock exchange, the BSC Sensex. I'm like, I'm really bullish on the India story. Uh, I want to buy that index. I can't, I'm living in Switzerland. I can't send money to India because once you send money to India, your money is trapped, right? Like it's very hard to get it back outside. And if you buy an index fund for the BSC Sensex in Switzerland, the the cost structure of those funds is extremely high. Like they are, these funds are, 50 times more expensive than your typical S&P 500 fund. So I actually, uh, being an Indian, wanting to bet on the India story, have not. And I'm just waiting for the day I can go long on some kind of BAC Sensex on on Bitcoin, or on, sorry, on DYMDX. So uh, like that's kind of one of the things that, that excite me the most. Uh, I, I don't know whether this market will take off or not. You should create it. You should you should build this permissionless market and do it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like there's no index I can buy today. So I actually need a perpetual a long perpetual contact contract on the BC sensor. We will we will see how things get uh, get uh, get to shape and how people decide to go. I think the governance will be also important around this product, making sure not all kind of products uh, get to get to happen. We still evolve into a world uh, with uh, some uh, some regulations and some compliance issue, which uh, we don't want to do shortcuts on. But there is definitely a, a ground for uh, for a lot of innovations and and helping better distribution to of financial opportunities. Essentially, do you think it's possible for 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 DeFi? I mean, we've been talking about DYDX and, and and Uniswap, and I think you know in the context of what happened last year with FTX, a lot of people were thinking, uh, and certainly I was thinking about, you know, how can we get DeFi to arrive to a point where it can compete uh, and, and be indistinguishable from the experience of centralized exchanges? And I know this is 
the DYDX kind of mission, and this is what the product aims to be. But I mean, what what are the biggest challenges in terms of making that happen? And, and do you think that uh, it, it is possible for for DeFi to get to a point where it's indistinguishable from um, from fully centralized exchanges and and really compete, you know, sort of on par uh, with the type of performance, with the type of UX, with the type of like onboarding experience that we get with uh, centralized changes. I think we define needs to keep having his own identity and his own mission. If we if we are just running after replicating and uh, uh, and kind of matching the experience uh, of centralized exchanges or experience in in traditional finance, I'm very confident we will get there. But will this be sufficient to bring a lot of uh, new users to the space? I don't think it will. Um, do we have in our hands? Um, the technology and the capabilities to create new products, which will be really unique to DeFi and brings people into our space. The same way ICO has been bringing a lot of people in our space back in the days. The same way NFTs have been bringing artists and collectioners uh, in our space. And now people in the video games uh, industry are building um, uh, digital assets out of NFTs within the video game space because it's very unique and only only uh, blockchain or, or, or crypto uh, infrastructure can provide that, that. So I think it's very important to keep innovating and focusing on this kind of innovation. DYDX focusing on perps is, is one illustration of that. The other things to keep thinking about is also how you keep building public blockchain and infrastructure, which can get different points of entry. I am a strong believer that not everyone will start his crypto journey with a MetaMask wallet. Uh, some people will come to crypto via their existing uh, financial service providers. So if you think of your banker today, uh, uh, he's probably, uh, for the most part, uh, his core business is deposit. So you, you drop your salary every month and they make a little bit of money out of, uh, out of your deposit. And then banks, for the most part, are all doing the same. What they do is they package services from others. So I think the distribution also of, of DeFi will will uh, will evolve. Some people will keep going directly, maybe to the uh, to the uh, to the services they use. Should it be Uniswap, DYDX, or some others? And some others will be over, uh, essentially being offered access to DeFi uh, via via some hybrid gateways. Uh, so I strongly believe that the new wave of fintech will essentially be sitting on DeFi infrastructure. So DeFi as a back end, and the front end will be some kind of um, a fintech, uh, a fintech user interface where they will provide customer support. They will provide simplify UX and 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 uh, just simplify the onboard uh, 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 onboard and offboard of uh, of users and and funds overall in the space. So really, the the way I feel uh, DeFi will keep progressing in the in the years to come is via really sole DeFi type of innovation as well as um, being um, a little bit more open to. Uh, a variety of, of uh, entry doors into DeFi and, and having this kind of hybrid and gateways to DeFi, which should be the, the traditional uh, traditional players, which will be coming with with uh, with the earls of customers. And I think we we see that already happening slowly but surely. Uh, some years ago, uh, Coinbase was offering the earl program, which was essentially allowing a Coinbase users to get access to Compound. Uh, and simplifying the, the experience for them. And I think it was very, very meaningful in terms of product experience. If you think of what Robinhood is doing, uh, we were thinking that the world of equity trading was kind of stuck at the, at the Charles Schwab or whatever bank experience. And yet they came and they provided like better experience for stock trading. And they also started to onboard their users on, on crypto. And this is really a big impact in terms of uh, of consumptions of uh, of DeFi, so I think the traditional finance and and decentralized finance will overlap, and I think also the uh, the, the distribution of DeFi will uh, will evolve very quickly. The same way the internet was initially distributed by a handful of internet service providers, and nowadays uh, we get access to the internet via our phone, via our fridge, via our laptops. There is multiple ways for machines and ourselves to to access the internet. So, the, so Charles, like you think that I find quite crazy about the perpetual story and the the uh, permissionless listing of markets in the UIDXs is that the 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 idea of the perpetual contract was actually invented by the economist Robert Schiller in 1992. 
because prior to that, you know, CFDs contracts for a difference existed, but they would have uh, uh, they would have you know defined time limits, and he invented the perpetual. And then the perpetual was summarily ignored by traditional finance for twenty six years. There was there's no trad five perpetuals market that you can do anything meaningful with. And then it's the rise of crypto that gave life to the first perpetual market, which was centralized. And then DYDX, centralized and now decentralized. Robert Schiller, meanwhile himself, is a prominent crypto skeptic, <laughs> the inventor of the perpetuals. And now kind of like with the permissionless markets, it's like crypto perpetuals markets are just around the corner of integrating, you know, like what would be traditional assets, indexes and stocks and commodities. And it's really an interesting story that like how crypto can take an idea from TradFi and actually bring it to success, hopefully in TradFi itself, right? For shares and uh, commodities and things like that. So it really demonstrates the power of permissionless innovation that our industry industry has. So DYDX just launched uh, uh, mainnet. It's in the alpha stage currently. Um, yeah, give us a give us an overview of like the current state of DYDX in these early weeks. Uh, what is the activity on the chain? Uh, staking uh, br tokens being bridged over. Uh, what's the snapshot of D DYDX right now, and what should users expect? And when they go to DYDX, uh, as as the platform has just launched, what kind of features are are, are, are live, and what kind of things can they do with the platform? So the DYDX chain was launched a few weeks ago by uh, the Genesis validators together with the DYDX operation DAO. Uh, so right now, the 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 kind of migration of the Ethereum DYDX token to the DYDX chain token is undergoing. Uh, we have at the time of recording about 3 million tokens uh, which have been already staked and there is millions of tokens coming uh, on a daily basis to the chain to essentially prepare and, and uh, prepare the chain and secure the chain further. Uh, the community will vote in a few days uh, to move away from the alpha period to the beta period where a limited uh, type of trading activities will be uh, allowed for a limited number of trading pairs as well as limited uh, trading volume and the full launch of the chain should be happening in, uh, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, the big uh, added, uh, I mean, the, the big proposition uh, for token holders, uh, if they decide to migrate uh, from Ethereum to the DYDX chain, is to stake their tokens with DYDX chain validators. Uh, so uh, what the community decided uh, some weeks ago was to essentially distribute 100% of the fees collected by the DYDX protocol to the validators and therefore to the stakers. And the fees are coming in the form of USDC. So that's also something which is quite new in our space. Uh, usually when you see a new chain being launched, uh, it's um, essentially secured by validators and, and, and these validators are rewarded but with uh, inflation of new tokens. In the case of DYDX, DYDX is already an application with uh, a great level of success, leader in its space, and uh, all, the, re all the, the fees collected by the protocol will be rewarded to stakers uh, for the DYD exchange in the form of USDCs. So that's a, a very uh, strong proposition. And I think uh, a nice and interesting twist of business models for, for many people in our space, where when you have reached a certain level of growth and certain level of, um, of uh, operations, essentially, and you decide to totally open source and decentralize, um, people, all the people contributing to the security of the chain get rewarded. And, and that's really why we see so much interest right now in, uh, in people bridging over uh, to the DYDX chain and staking with, uh, with validators. There is about 60 validators which can be active today within the chain. And there is a set of about 120 validators which are kind of competing to be within the active set uh, of, uh, of the chain. So what, one thing that uh, that we noticed was that there's currently a lot of the voting power, the validator voting power, that's concentrated in a small number of validators. I believe the top three validators have something close to 50%, and, and the top validator has, I think, over 30%. What, 
what's going on here and like how are you dealing with some of the challenges of distributing that validator set because i i believe that there aren't any um for the moment there there, there aren't any plans to have a, a a delegation program from the foundation so how will you deal with some of this uh some of these growing pains so that's something we pay attention to. Uh, the chain is only a, a few weeks old. Uh, it's not totally active yet. So this kind of voting power uh, rebalancing is uh, something to pay attention to, but it's not representing uh, a risk at this moment since the chain is not totally active and the, the trading has not been acti activated yet. Um, there is uh, the, for the DYDX Foundation will be uh, staking uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. So we are defining exactly the, the kind of policy around that. Uh, but what is interesting to see is that there is uh, uh, different type of validators coming up, different type of token holders also migrating. And the DAO, uh, DYDX DAO and the community has also voted an incentive program uh, for the coming months where essentially traders will be incentivized to use as a newly launched uh, DYDX chain and DYDX uh, uh, protocol. And this will be essentially increasing the number of, uh, the number of fees distributed to validators. One dynamic we keep an eye on is also the loca localization of, uh, of validators. When, we, when you, you are in the world of trading, uh, as you can probably see in the world of uh, equity trading, uh, there is um, a certain um, uh, type of optimization a large trading house uh, will, uh, will put in place is to be uh, co-located or located the closest to the marketplace. And it's interesting to see here in the topology of the DYDX uh, chain and the new DYDX protocol that the order book is now totally decentralized. So we will, we will probably see in the, coming, uh, in the coming months some interesting dynamics and I have absolutely no idea where, where it's going to go exactly. But uh, probably at some point the localization of the servers will might be uh, kind of uh, trying to be not, not too far from one another just for the optimization of latency. And, uh, and making sure that you can get the best and the most optimal uh, information. So one more time, the, the order book on DYDX chain is distributed. It's sitting on the, on the RAM memory of validators and the validators keep whispering and updating each other's uh, the, the order book. When two orders match, uh, if there is uh, two orders matching at the, same, uh, the same time or more or less at the same time, at the time of consensus, the chain will check exactly uh, the, the kind of timestamp and, and let, let the right uh, trade happening. But um, the, the chain is young, the chain is growing fast, and uh, we have also some very uh, professional validators, which is also interesting to see how this industry of validators is getting more and more professional. And I'm very confident that things will balance right. The early days are just showing uh, a strong interest and, uh, and some early movers, but things will, uh, will balance uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a healthy way in the coming weeks. Yeah, I mean, this is really interesting because, like, you know, the DYDX is decentralizing as a protocol. The governance is decentralizing. You know, we want to have permissionless markets. And I think that sort of, like, aligns with the ethos of crypto and, and certainly uh, is something that's quite encouraging. But at the same time, there's this, you know, as you mentioned, there, there is this pressure for validators to be close to where their customers are, where uh, customers are, are, are initiating trades from. And I, I have a feeling that with DYDX, at least, you know, large trading firms that are using DYDX are going to want to interact with validators that where the servers are close to them. And that might lead to some amount of centralization. Let's say that there are a lot of DYDX traders or institutional users, say like in New York, we might see a lot of the validators moving to that area or, or having sort of like validators being uh, co-located in, in areas close to where the, the, the users are. You know what? What kind of risks does that, does that present? In I mean, both in terms of I think like governance of the chain, running the chain, things like power grid failure. You know, because we're moving, we're moving in a de decentralized way from the protocol governance side, but at the same time, you know, some of the infrastructure might have some aspects of centralization that we need to deal with. How do you deal with that, and how do you balance that out? Sure, maybe just a, a quick, uh, a quick. Uh Decision. There is no the users from the US are geo-blocked uh, uh, from from the early days of, of DYDX. So the example of uh, of traders in New York does not apply to uh, to DYDX. But just to take the concept, uh, we 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 have the world of finance, which is having different kind of hubs. You think of London, you think of Singapore, you think of Hong Kong, you think of Tokyo, 
you think of India. So finance is a global industry today. Um, some of these markets are kind of close to outsiders, uh, but the world of DeFi is actually open. So I think we will see some probably clusters, uh, but eventually the world of trading, and we see that in the, in the crypto market, uh, crypto markets are operating 24-7, and we see part of the world, Asia is one of them, Europe is another one, uh, where we have like uh, a big clusters of activities. So uh, will we'll, uh, uh, validators kind of clusterize uh, in, 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 a, in a way? Possibly that's something we will see the, in the future. But uh, at this moment in time, the, the set of validators of, of, uh, of the DYD exchange is, uh, is well spread. That's something interesting to see how the, how the, the kind of topology of the, of the network will evolve over time. We see this kind of concentration also for, uh, I would say, legacy networks such as Bitcoin or, or Ethereum, where uh, you will see big hubs of validators being for the most part in Europe, in some part of Asia. Uh, so we, don't, we should not de deviate too much from this. But it's interesting to see how the layer of, of the, the trading firms will kind of shape this, uh, this type of clusters we might see uh, in, the, in the coming years on the DYDX chain. I know there is DYDX grants program, which is working on a lot of dashboards for the new chain. So users and everyone will be able to really keep the pulse on the, uh, on the protocol, understanding how things are evolving, uh, where the trades are happening. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very interesting to see also a, a new infrastructure uh, literally at the opposite of the centralized uh, crypto exchanges being totally transparent where data will be able to be consumed and, and to drive decisions or to drive uh, kind of uh, governance decisions or trading decisions depending who you are as a user. Mm. I think this might be a good time to talk a little bit about the, the different entities uh, that 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 govern DYDX. So we talked about the DAO already. There's the foundation. What are the roles of all of these entities as it relates to DYDX? Absolutely. So the original company behind DYDX is DYDX Trading Inc. Uh, created uh, by uh, Antonio Giuliano. He's a CEO over there. Uh, the foundation was created two years ago. Uh, we I am the CEO of the foundation. We are registered in Zug in Switzerland. And the foundation is really we're focusing on decentralized governance, enabling the DAOs, uh, doing a lot of go-to-market activities in general to activate and connect with the different users and builders of, uh, of the DYDX uh, protocol. And we have also two DAOs. Uh, so the uh, DYDX Grants DAO uh, has been built by the community. Uh, it's funded by the community. Most of the wealth in, uh, in the YDX ecosystem is in the end of the community. The foundation is, is not the Lord, as, as you can see in some other uh, blockchain ecosystem. Uh, we, we don't have the majority of the tokens at all, as uh, the vast majority of the tokens are owned by the community treasury. So besides the, 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 uh, the, the grants, now, there is also, uh, since uh, early January this year, the DYDX Operation DAO, which uh, one more time was created by the community following a series of votes, as well as funded by the community. So they receive uh, about 6 million US dollars of funding. And their role as the other DAO is really to run some core infrastructure uh, for the DYDX exchange, such as the indexer, for example, they are running a front end and, and uh, making sure that the, the operation of the chain are, are fully functional. Technically, the chain is run by validators. Uh, but the operation DAO is, uh, is making sure that uh, all, uh, all validators get the right level of service and the right distribution of updated software where, whenever, they, whenever they want. So that's, uh, that I would say, that I would say uh, that's f the four entities which are visible uh, uh, outside of, uh, of the DYDX ecosystem. But overall, there is probably 20 to 50 different companies building and co-building around DYDX. So if you look at the number of personnel uh, involved with the YDX today. If you bring together people doing research, uh, people doing uh, different dashboards, the validators team, you probably have 500 to 600 people working on the YDX today. The YDX is a protocol of builders for traders, and there is a, a lot of, of builders we need. Should they be software developers, uh, validators, dashboard, uh, indexers, full node providers? Uh, people doing research on MEVs and some other uh, strategic topic for the for the protocol. So it's a very fast growing ecosystem, which is very interesting. Also, is um, I would say the different type of engineers you will get to meet within the ecosystem. Obviously, you've got blockchain engineers, 
uh, which are uh, specialized in building and, and operating uh, blockchain systems, but a lot of financial engineers also, which will have a very good understanding of APIs, very good understanding of the uh, pace of consensus and, and how an order book should be run and, and optimized. Uh, people which are focused exclusively on MEV, for example, doing research or building code dedicated to that. So there is really a large panel of talents, uh, which is super energizing. So, uh, so Charles, I'm actually curious, um, given that the order book is being run with, with validators, um, itself, and it's a decentralized order book and it's, as far as I know, a new construction for the industry. How will the MEV landscape shape up in DYDX because of this new construction? Or is there something like MEV at all in so there is obviously MEV uh, potentials uh, within within the chain. Uh, that's a question which uh, has been a focus for many since the early days. Uh, so uh, the WDX protocol has been working with the Skip uh, protocol uh, to uh, put in place some first, I would say, mitigations and first uh, data collections uh, infrastructure in place with the new chain. Uh, Chorus One also has been doing some research via the grants program uh, of the DYDX grants DAO on how MEV could be impacting the protocol overall. The reality is uh, everything has been put in place for the early days of uh, of the chain to exist and to mitigate as much as it can MEV. But MEV is an ongoing topic. Uh, I think the just the forces of the market, the traders, uh, the, uh, everyone involved with the chain We'll, uh, we'll keep optimizing, we'll keep exploring this, uh, this topic. But before you get enough data uh, and, and data collection infrastructure put in place, you can't really uh, go, uh, go further too much. So there will probably be MEV uh, on the DYDX chain as there is on, uh, on Ethereum, for example. Uh, but uh, all, uh, all talents are really in place to make sure that uh, this will be identified and, and mitigated as well. Um, the DYDX uh, community has been really vocal about uh, being tough with, uh, with MEV practitioners. Uh, so should the validators misbehave, eventually there is uh, a lot of conversations right now on how they can be slashed and, and possibly kicked off of the, uh, of the chain very quickly uh, so that uh, all the, the marketplace in general stays as healthy as, as possible. Tell us about how you're integrating with Skip and you know, what's the technology that, I mean, they're, they're providing the, this, uh, this block SDK uh, that allows chains to construct their blocks in ways that really serve the purpose of their use case. Um, what are some of the ways that, that Skip uh, can benefit DYDX? And, and also, you know, in, in terms of how MEV should be handled, I know it's ultimately up to the community, but what is your opinion about uh, how MEV should be distributed, or what types of MEV you know should be allowed to uh, uh, to be utilized by by validators, and what other types of activity you know, should should the YDX ultimately uh, prohibit? So the, the the skip program is run by the DYDX uh, Grand DAO uh, team. So this is an independent group of uh, of the foundation. But essentially, Skip has been already publishing. As some kind of uh, a dashboard which uh, scan constantly uh, the the order books of the different validators to understand which validators will get the latest uh, and most updated uh, order book, as well as which validators will start to misbehave. I think maybe uh, put a trade in place, uh, having some kind of uh, information they should not be le leveraging. So that's already that's always something which. Uh, where you look at uh, the kind of trade flow of a validator as well as you put this trade flow against the order book and you start to try to, to identify if there is some, uh, some kind of trade practices which, which are unfair and, 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 and not healthy. So that's really what Skip is, has been able to put together today. The foundation is not involved directly with um, uh, the, the building of, uh, of the software itself, but more in, uh, in, in the ecosystem overall. The way I see MEV being uh, evolving over time is I think it should be very highly monitored. Uh, MEV is not necessarily always bad, but it has to be kind of constrained and, and understood to make sure it remains something which uh, which uh, which does not become uh, unhealthy uh, within the marketplace overall. And we've seen in some uh, in some other protocols uh, within Cosmos 
where MEV will, was redistributed uh, either to stakers or maybe to some community treasury. And that's something which uh, can probably be uh, be explored with uh, with the community. Once again, the the protocol is fairly young. Uh, there is a lot of attention on MEV, and uh, I'm confident that overall, the right decision, the right upgrade of software will be made so that uh, it's uh, it's not uh, counterproductive within uh, within the protocol. So, what has it been like working with the Cosmos ecosystem? You know, what what is your impression of you know the state of Cosmos and I think from, from, from my perspective, like DYDX uh, very much, you know, it utilizes the Cosmos stack, but it doesn't really identify itself as a Cosmos chain. Um, you know, I, I sometimes describe it as, you know, Apple uses the Unix and a lot of the Linux components, but it doesn't brand itself as a Linux operating system. Yeah. How do you see that relationship with DYDX and Cosmos? And uh, yeah, what are, how, how, what, are your, what are your thoughts on like the Cosmos ecosystem generally? The Cosmos ecosystem has been, as you said, very, very much welcoming DYDX. So we, we got a lot of uh, helpful support from many different teams within the Cosmos ecosystem. And that's something which goes beyond the crypto Twitter, where people uh, kind of argue on different things. The reality is uh, when you come as a builder in the Cosmos ecosystem, you're more than welcome. And, uh, and there is no competition. It's basically about growing the, the pie of crypto in general. And we happen to be working on the same uh, on the same stack. So a lot of support from various div- uh, from various projects, um, really welcoming the YDX overall. Something we note uh, we've been noticing is uh, a different level of uh, I would say of tools around the Cosmos ecosystem versus uh, the Ethereum space. So if you need uh, multi sig, if you need different things, there is not so much choice yet within uh, within Cosmos. But good uh, good products are coming in uh, definitely. Um, I think there is also this specific identity of Cosmos. Uh, sovereign chains means that not every project is uh, dedicated the same way and has the same kind of culture as you will get if you're coming from, from Bitcoin or Ethereum. Some Cosmos chains have been uh, running their own things without being too much involved with, uh, with the community itself. It does not mean there is no interest, but it means these teams are, are leveraging the software in different ways. Uh, some people, uh, some people say DYDX is really a um, uh, product-focused team and and not uh, kind of blockchain agnostic. And I would not disagree with that. The same way, if you think of your users and uh, you want to uh, keep improving the experience for your users, if you if an engineer from WhatsApp or an engineer from uh, from Zoom wants to move away from a certain type of database to another one, they should do it for 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 their users and their business overall. But overall, the relationship with uh, with Cosmos is great. We are connecting. We are also, I guess, enabling uh, quite a few projects with um, with uh, DYDX coming within the Cosmos ecosystem. I'm thinking of Snowboard. I'm thinking of uh, some other projects which we are building uh, together with DYDX, different infrastructure. So overall, it's a very positive experience, and we were glad to contribute in uh, and being a good citizen of the the Cosmos ecosystem. Are we branding ourselves as a Cosmos stack? No, because our users don't really care. The same way, I have no idea exactly what is the software behind uh, the podcast I'm I'm listening today. I just care about the content, the team, and the people producing this. So uh, I think that's the most important. And eventually, this bring more people having this kind of uh, product sole focus rather than trying to get the full stack uh, as a tribe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think. You know, for, if if we zoom out, right? If we zoom out, uh, crypto and and all of the you know, sort of like communities that exist within crypto, and and sometimes you know the the rivalries between different stacks of the tech, it, it really doesn't matter in the end. In the end, like we're all trying to build a, a more decentralized, more permissionless, more trust minimized version of the web, and certainly of the financial system. And I think that 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 approach makes more sense, right? Like, I mean, we want to build products that work. Who cares what technology is underlying uh, those products as long as users are able to use them, uh, the user experience is good, and they reap the benefits of that technology being open and permissionless and trust minimized. Which I think brings me to my next question, which is this talk that you gave at uh, at Cosmoverse, um, which was about this concept of Astropolis. 
So for those who didn't see the talk, I'll put the link in the show notes, but yeah, what is this idea about? Can you sort of break this down and so like your vision for the future? Absolutely. The, the goal of this exercise was really to kind of uh, project uh, myself, the foundation, the teams uh, into what could be the YDX in 10 years. So it's it's really some kind of fiction uh, exercise, projecting ourselves in, uh, in, uh, in 2033 and thinking, okay, well, how is the world around us and how is this technology stacks and, 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 and tech tribes are, are evolving? So in essence, it's, it's more about looking at how the community has been evolving and how the users are, are evolving around, uh, around crypto and DeFi in general. Uh, obviously, we will see more and more machines uh, as they are already today, but not always visible to us, more and more machines using DeFi. Uh, should they be AI allies or AI agents? and starting to uh, manage their own smart contracts, manage their own payment systems, going and, and kind of put assets to work on, on DeFi systems. So that's something I think which, uh, which is coming uh, and will, uh, will kind of come slow and, 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 and burst into our face very quickly, thinking that, uh, showing that it's, it brings value and, uh, and also looking at how our, our community of builders uh, will, be, will be competing maybe among, the, among each other I don't think we will compete on technology so much anymore, but we will more compete on, on ethos and the way we implement things. I think this, uh, this is really given that all the technology we are building is open source. The things which will make us trust this project or this brand or this community will be really the, the ethics and, and the reasons and the values we are, we are putting into, into our works and, uh, and projects. So yeah, I really invite everyone to kind of look at um, uh, at these talks and uh, hopefully find some inspirations. When I look at DYDX uh, more more closely within the, within the context of uh, uh, projections in in ten years, um, I see the DYDX chain uh, ossifying the same way Bitcoin or, or Ethereum uh, have ossified or are ossifying, and uh, and more and more applications, thousands of derivative markets happening, and more and more index. And and probably um, more and more overlaps with uh, with uh, AI and um, and and the crypto market in general, being able to enable, for example, DAOs and uh, and humans behind the DAOs with providing better reports, helping them to take decisions, automating a certain level of decisions, getting more uh, more kind of neutral uh, access to to data, and and seeing also more and more users of of DYDX, uh, should they be institutional so, or large users starting to invest with their own resources and, and deploy personnel uh, on the protocol. So not only kind of using the software, but contributing to the software and, and open sourcing uh, the software they, they, they are using and the innovation they put into, into the software. That's something we see also here and there. Uh, we see some large companies um, deploying resources, deploying engineers for Ethereum, for Bitcoin, for Solana. Uh, we, we start to see also signals uh, that uh, users or major users of DYDX are, are deploying resources, deploying Mindshare to make the software evolve, to provide feedback, to bring additional uh, tools around the, around the protocol itself. So that's very interesting to see also how this concept of public good can be much more uh, closer to business and eventually uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 accelerating the flying wheel and, and making sure it's, it's, it keeps growing and, and helps the protocol to, to keep dominating uh, its, uh, its, uh, its market, such as uh, the perpetuals for DYDX. Yeah, it was a really inspiring talk. It, it, you know, it, it, for me, it resonated with because, you know, it is very sort of forward thinking and it is sort of a fiction, right? Like it, it's kind of like sci-fi future, like, you know, the, the, the talk. And it reminded me a lot of this, um, this talk uh, by Mike Hearn uh, that he gave in like 2014, um, I, I think at Google or something where he's talking about like the future of crypto and how like crypto will be used to um, sort of power this, this army of like self-driving cars and uh, it gave me the same sort of vibe, so I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I encourage people to to go check it out. And you mentioned Urbit in your talk, um, and so I'm curious, like, how you see Urbit tying into all this? Um, yeah, I guess Urbit is a bit of sci-fi, also as it is today. 
there is some bits and pieces which are concrete, but it's not exactly ready. So that's probably why it's inspiring, at least for me. I see uh, the ingredients are there, the product experience is not uh, exactly here, but it's a uh, it's a good it's a good um, it's a good inspiration. It's probably at least it makes sense to me on how computing is evolving and how we will be able to to consume networks and being part of networks in a different way. So decentralization comes with crypto, but there is the overall decentralization of the internet, which needs to make some progress as well. And how much progress we've been making so far is questionable. Uh, more and more big firms are open sourcing, but it's still like very much, uh, uh, very much in a in the hands of a, a selected few. So uh, community is making a bet on decentralizing further the internet resonates with me. So I'm paying attention to a bit in uh, to that extent. And I have to say, I'm very impressed by how much things are happening. It's often start like this with some people or a small group of, of builders having an idea and it looks a little bit random, but yet interesting. So you try to pay attention. And eventually you see them making progress and, and, and it surprises you. So when I see, for example, people being able to deploy uh, their own front end of, um, of Uniswap or, uh, or Osmosis within their, uh, their Urbit instances uh, without having too much conflict of versioning and making sure this is the right uh, front end they are running, I think that's interesting. Is it ready for mass market? I don't think so. Uh, will it be ready at some point? Probably. Well. Uh, I say I would say the, the jury is out uh, on the timeline, but there is definitely something happening there, and uh, I'm paying attention. So on this topic of the intersection of AI and and crypto, then there are kind of like many business leaders, many strategic thinkers that you know, okay, somehow these two these two areas are are going to have an intersection. There's going to be a merger. And there'll be AI agents which might be running on top of LLMs, and they are transacting on 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 blockchain. So the common element is always okay. There's an LLM or a model that's huge, that's intelligent. That there's some software written on top of that utilizes the model. There's an agent that behaves intelligently, and then that agent can plug into a crypto blockchain and it can do some transactions on the blockchain, and then. You, we can go to kind of uh, Valerie, the company that's like building this blockchain agent integration and Gnosis is doing similar things. That piece feels clear. Okay, they can be agents, they can transact onto crypto. Agreed. What I've never felt clear about is what will these AI agents, like maybe an individual agent or maybe even a swarm of AI agents transacting with crypto, what will they do for the user? Like, what is my, what do you think is your unmet need today that a swarm of crypto AI agents will be solving in, in 10 years? I think the needs are not clear yet because we there is a lot of needs which will come up from there. The way I start my thinking about AI and blockchain, blockchain is creating very high quality data sets. That's number one, uh, which is like uh, super easy for, for AI to kind of digest and produce uh, produce value out of these data sets, which come clean and very well labeled. So that's number one. So probably a faster kind of processing of data in general. One way I see um, AI is more AI allies. Uh, not only independent and autonomous kind of agents, but uh, agents which are my own ally to whatever I'm doing within my day. So if I'm participating in governance, for example, within a DAO, today the DAOs are still very young and are still making decisions based on sometimes um, uh, proper data sets and, and, and proper flows. And sometimes it's only uh, a lot of politics, right? So what I hope to see and what I, I feel will be coming uh, in, in due time will be uh, a DAO governance for this blockchain ecosystem, which will be based on much more uh, data related reports and kind of helping people to take decisions. So helping, helping DAOs to make, uh, to kind of avoid the politics or avoid the kind of latency of human coordination. So essentially enabling humans further into this world of blockchain DAOs. 
Um, it will help also to give identity to agents in general, making sure they consume the right data, they don't get corrupted by uh, by wrong flow of information. So there is many use cases, but the way I kind of uh, find myself comfortable thinking of of what could be AI uh, in a in a, in a, in five to ten years will be just a, a companion, uh, which will help me uh, as an individual if I am part of a DAO in in crypto or maybe which will help my DAO or DAO I'm part of to essentially provide more uh, more accurate and, and uh, updated reports, uh, helping to measure whatever KPI we've been putting together and mitigating the, the weaknesses humans have from time to time. So really seeing AI as, a, as an ally rather than uh, autonomous agents or, or competitors with us. Cool. Well, Charles, uh, this has been a really fascinating episode, really fascinating conversation. And um, yeah, thanks so much for being here with us at sharing um, all the interesting ha things happening in the DYDX ecosystem and also uh, opening our minds to the future of DeFi and what things might look like in the next decades to come. Certainly really excited to see um, DYDX moving closer to its uh, sort of, you know, moving out of alpha and beta and into a more like production phase. And um, really excited to see all of the interesting perpetuals markets that people will be building there when um, when permissionless markets um, become, uh, go online. So yeah, thanks again. And uh, we'll look forward to see you soon. Thanks, I appreciate the talk. Thank you, cheers.